All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So I think I figured out all my uh, technical issues and now we can go ahead and uh, get started a bit. So right now I just wanna look at some definitional items related to structures. Um, and so first of all, this course is called structural analysis. So let's think about what this means. I wanna break this down and look at both of the terms in the description, structural analysis. And I believe now we are uh, correctly flipped around, so we should be fine. Okay, so what is structural analysis? Well, we have two terms. First, we have the term structure. And then we have the term analysis. Let's just start the basics and break these two things down. So first of all, what is a structure? Now I'm sure you've uh, heard the term structure plenty of times before. I'm sure you've used it both formally and informally. Um, and if and there is no single single definition of a structure, uh, you know, we could ask a dozen engineers what a structure is and get a dozen different answers. But uh, for now, let me use a simple uh, working definition. So what I might say is a structure is. Maybe I could define a structure as something like this. Maybe a, a framework or object that can carry load. Uh, to some source of reaction. or reactions, and in order to serve some purpose. I can write the word purpose properly. So if I were to do just a very quick definition, that would be one I could use. Um, and I'm sure you could probably create a better one, but just some basic, um, you know, food, uh, food or thought type stuff. So a framework or object that can carry load to some source of reactions in order to serve some purpose. What do I mean by that? Well, let me go ahead and draw this. Think about something like a building. So let's say we have oh, some sort of building. I don't know, a little happy house, something like this. Could be a tower, could be a building, whatever you want to say. And think about something like wind load. Well, what is the load in this case? The load is the wind, the force, or more precisely, the force generated by the wind. Um, a house or a building or an office building or whatever it might be, it needs to be able to resist the wind load, but then what does it do with it? It doesn't just make the forces disappear, rather it translates them or transfers them to the ground, in this case would be like a ground shear. So the purpose of this structure is to gather up loads and deliver them to, the, to a source of resistance. And usually when we're talking about conventional civil structures, we're talking about the foundation. So usually we're talking about uh, something that we want to gather certain types of loads up and, do, and then deliver them um, to a source of resistance or some sort of, uh, some sort of rigid object or some sort of um, location that can ultimately provide resistance to those. And so, and for pretty much everything, again, for pretty much everything that you're gonna be designing as a civil engineer, the ultimate source of resistance is usually the soil, the ground, the planet in other words. And so uh, then there are, now there are two main types of loads that you'll wanna uh, consider. So there's two main types of loads. Let's look at this. Again, there are two main types of loads that structures need to be able to need to be able to resist. And 
obviously you can have cases where these don't break down so neatly, but uh, there's still, the, in terms of design, the way we design our civil, just regular civil structures and buildings and that sort of thing, we tend to consider two types of loads. And this would be gravity loads. and lateral loads. And you can probably tell the difference between these, the part, you can probably just by their names tell the difference between these. Uh, gravity loads are going to be vertical and lateral loads are going to be horizontal. And in terms of vertical, you know, gravity loads, uh, forces that are ultimately generated by gravity, um, what we're typically looking at is dead load and live load. Dead load represents the weight of the structure itself. It represents, um, it represents essentially, not just the structure, but the building itself. Um, dead load represents any sort of installation or any sort of object in a building that is considered permanent. So for example, um, even though you could remodel your house and change the wall, interior walls around and that sort of thing, drywall is still considered fairly permanent. So we regard that as a dead load. Live load on the other hand is anything that's going to move around. So that means people, that means furniture, that means um, anything that isn't bolted down basically, that's gonna be your live load. And then your um, lateral loads, the big ones here are going to be uh, well, the big ones here are going to be seismic. So in other words, earthquake, and then wind. And uh, when we design structures, we look at uh, both of these separately. In order to, the considerations to design for lateral versus gravity loading are very different. So we often talk about the gravity force resisting system and the lateral force resisting system. Um, these are two very different types of loads and they are resisted often using entirely different systems. And so we talk about them um, separately. Now, of course, this isn't necessarily so clean because <clears throat> think about something like wind load. Something like wind load, we often consider it a horizontal load, but you can also have parts of wind loading that are, for example, roof uplift. So even though wind might be primarily uh, horizontal, wind still also generates some vertical loading. So this can get a little more complex. And there are all sorts of other minor types of uh, loads of both of these. For example, there's uh, not necessarily minor, but maybe uh, less prominent in most cases. So for example, vertical, or for example, our gravity loading, in addition to live load and dead load, you can have, also have things like rain load, which is like the weight of uh, rain that is pooling on say like a flat roof. Um, you could have snow load, which is the same sort of thing. There's when, um, in a cold weather environment, in a very, uh, in a very, uh, in a latitude that gets or climate that gets a lot of snow, um, you'll need to actually consider that when designing buildings, including buildings here in the in Carvalis, um, up in Portland. Uh, any environment or any location that occasionally gets snowfall, you're going to have to actually design for a certain amount of snow load in your buildings. Okay, so there's that. Next, let's look at what uh, what do we mean by analysis? So we know what a structure is. And now, what does analysis mean? Let's see. So analysis, uh, rather than providing a definition, it's probably best to consider analysis in contrast to something. And you probably know what that is. And that is in contrast to design. Analysis versus design. So analysis is you're basically doing lots of uh, various calculations. So um, calculations detailing or considerations for an existing solution. This is, this is key, an existing solution to some problem. And what this could mean in the context of uh, this course is that you would have, for example, a structure and you already, you have a model structure, you already have the beams, the columns, the layout, et cetera. And maybe I tell you, okay, here's this structure and it has a load of 10 kips applied to it, analyze the deflections, 
uh, the rotations uh, at the member ends, the forces, the stresses, all that sort of thing. So I would give you the start. If I was asking you to analyze a problem, I would be giving you the details of the structure and then asking you to run through calculations uh, related to that. Design is something a little different. You're doing a lot of the same things, except that you're doing the same kind of, often the same kind of calculations and considerations, applying the same sort of design codes and that sort of thing. But you are starting with sort of a blank page. Uh, so in other words, I'm not telling you, here's a structure, find the forces in it or find the stresses in it. I'm saying, here is something, you need to design a structure, you need to create a structure that can resist these certain loads. I want you to actually design the layout. I want you to design um, size the members, that sort of thing. So it really has a blank page approach. Also, this is usually one and done. In other words, if the design is already figured, when you're analyzing it, that's typically a once and done process. You work, you start through it, you work through the calculations and you arrive at a final answer and you're done. Design on the other hand tends to be iterative. What I mean by that is that your, um, the results of one analysis are then fed back into your design and then you have to reanalyze something uh, often through several loops of iteration, uh, uh, often through several iterative loops. Let's see, what do I mean by that? Well, let's consider this. Consider this for a moment. My GPS. Okay. okay, hopefully that didn't interfere too much. Okay, so um, you have, say you're doing a seismic design or a gravity design. So let's consider something like gravity design, gravity load design. Or the gravity force resisting system. So what you might do is you might start with your loads, uh, start with loads. Then based on the various forces and stresses you calculate, or you might say two, you calculate stresses, or maybe calculate stresses and deflections. Or actually, how, there's a bigger problem before you can just go and calculate stresses and deflections. And that problem is that you need to actually have some sort of model structure in order to apply those to you. You can't just go and uh, calculate. If, if I want to know how much something is going to deflect, say like a cantilever beam or something, uh, I need to have some idea of its section. Otherwise, I don't have anything to compare my loads to. So I can start with my loads. And then two, I could, but, but so I need to have some starting point. And so, the, uh, so what I might do is I might just assume some reasonable initial design. Uh, assume some initial design. Then after that, using that design, those member sizes, those member lengths, et cetera, I might go and calculate, um, say stresses for now. Let's just keep it simple and calculate stresses. And then once I have those, those stresses, I might uh, redesign members. If the stresses are too great in the members, I'm gonna make them thicker, I'm gonna make them stouter, I'm gonna make them stronger. If they are way too strong, in other words, if I have members that are carrying, that have twice as much capacity as I need, um, that's wasted material. Um, and so I'm going to make those members lighter in order to not waste so much material. Uh, you, you may have heard the old saying before that anyone can make a bridge that will stand up. It takes a structural engineer to design one that will barely stand up. And really that's one of the things we often do as engineers. So once you, now the tricky part is once you redesign those members is that uh, that will then go and go back and affect your gravity load or your weight, for example. Think about it. If I make a, a, a lot of the loads that we deal with um, come from member self-weight. 
And if I make a member, uh, if I make a slab or a beam or a column heavier or lighter, then my weight on my building is going to change, which means that my um, that my initial loads have now changed. And so I then have to go back to the beginning and I'll end up working through this iteration loop several times. So I, um, I calculate my, I start with an initial design, I calculate my initial loads, I then go and calculate stresses, and then I readjust my design and I may need to go through that loop several times before I arrive at some sort of final design. And that really is the fundamental difference in overall process between analysis and design. Analysis is a simple once and, once, uh, once and done uh, pass through process. Design is more of an iterative process that allows you to create something uh, from a blank page. Okay, so we've got that. We talked about what a structure is. We've talked about an, what analysis is. So good, we have now defined the very most basic terms of this class. I'm sure you've probably heard all those before. I'm just doing a bit of review, hopefully anyway. And even if you hadn't taken any civil engineering courses, I'm pretty sure you could have uh, given some basic definition for each of these, especially just uh, especially a structure. Most people, you know, you can go up and ask the average person on the street what a structure is, and they can give you some sort of, you know, reasonable working definition. Although it's not going to be quite as not quite technical as perhaps the one I gave, but that's neither here nor there. So let's go ahead and get this cleaned up and move on. Feel free to fast forward now. Okay, what's next? What's next? So we've looked at the definition of structures, we've looked at the definition of analysis versus design, lateral load versus gravity load, etc. Um, we've talked about the ultimate source of resistance, which of course is, um, which of course is usually the ground. We're talking about any kind of earth-based structure. Um, also, you can talk about. We might look at. Um, let's see. We might look at architecture versus engineering in terms of structures. And I should say structural, uh, structural engineering. If you're in any kind of really uh, real building, any kind of large building, uh, the design of the building and the structure is sort of an interplay between the architect and the engineer. And the architect is primarily concerned, of course, about human uses. They're concerned with things like having windows, having, um, having doorways, having reasonably designed rooms, having uh, you know, making sure there's not a column right in the middle of a critical location that's going to fundamentally interfere with the uh, occupancy and use of a building. That's what an architect does. An engineer, of course, your job as an engineer is to go and uh, take uh, the vision of an architect, the general vision or plan or whatever of an architect, and make it conform to the laws of physics. That is the job of a structural engineer. Now, architects do take one or two structural engineering classes typically, but they are uh, famously not necessarily the best at uh, actually designing something that will actually be able to withstand uh, gravity, uh, the forces of gravity, wind, seismic, etc. So ultimately, it is the design of a, the, the uh, job of the structural engineer to take uh, my, my favorite sort of uh, slightly disparaging version of this is that it's the job, it's the job of a structural engineer to take the uh, drug induced fever dreams of architects and to make something that will actually correspond uh, to the laws of reality. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, now, it is interesting to think about um, how we traditionally design structures versus how we do things now. Um, modern design in terms of, um, and by modern, I mean, you know, the last 50 years, but even the last like 200 years, we tend to design things now using the principles that we're going to learn about in this class. We use principles of uh, material strength. We use principles of um, estimated loads. You know, we like to use LRFD versus ASD, which we will talk about later. Um, we use all these tools of structural engineering. But historically, we didn't actually do that. 
if you're just if you were building a building um you know 500 years ago or something like that how would you actually do that how would you how would you calculate the forces and stresses in a building well the answer is you wouldn't um you know they obviously didn't know how to calculate stress in the 1500s because newton hadn't even been born yet or i guess i don't remember what year exactly newton was born but uh Anyway, he definitely wasn't a Newtonian mechanics, definitely wasn't a thing in the year 1500. And so instead, how buildings tend to be constructed was um, there would be various specialties like masons or uh, carpenters, that sort of thing. And these different trades would just have rules of thumb. Um, so for example, you might, have, you might have a rule of thumb that said, okay, well, if you're gonna make a building with walls this far apart, you know, there's like a roof or something, um, if you're making a, a building with walls this far apart, well, then you need to use uh, make use walls that are if you're doing like if you're like a mason or something, you might have a rule of thumb that says, okay, if you're going to have stone columns or walls separated by a distance of x, then um, you should have some walls that are you know thickness I don't know some function of x like if your walls are twenty if your walls are twenty feet apart, use a you know a brick wall three courses thick or whatever they had. I don't know the exact numbers that they would use, but everything in pre-modern times before modern engineering was based upon rules of thumb. So you would just have uh, you know, rules that were developed um, really over the generations. And often they are just developed from, um, well, trial and error. So you, people would build a building, mark how, remember how thick the walls were, how tall the columns were, how far apart the columns were. And if it fell over, well, they thought they, they realized that wasn't quite good enough. So when they built the next one, they would make the walls a little bit thicker, make the columns a little bit closer together, whatever it took. And, uh, or if they made a building um, and it did stand up, well, then maybe they can get away with making something slightly uh, less robust in the next iteration, in the next building. So traditionally, uh, buildings were constructed simply via, um, you know, hard run one uh, rules of thumb that were pay passed down in the trades generation to generation. And they were just developed really from building things, seeing what fell over and what didn't. And uh, that really was the historical method of building design. But thankfully, uh, we're past the methods literally used in the literal dark ages. Although 50 times not really dark ages, but uh, anyway, a lot of the, I'm sure a lot of the rules of thumb used in design back then could be traced back to the early medieval period but that's neither here nor there. Okay. So we're not gonna be working through a lot of calculations today, just looking at some basic terminology. There's some things to be aware of that are sort of, that will frame uh, the rest of the course. So we've looked at that. So let's see what else we got. And finally, I just wanna look at a few uh, structural elements. There are a few definitions you want to be aware of, and we will discuss these further on. But there are certain types of structural elements that um, that we'll be working with, that we'll be designing, that we'll be using to build larger structures. So the first thing you have are your axial elements. What I mean by this are elements that primarily carry axial load. And you could have a cable. One example would be a cable or a rope. These carry almost uh, solely tension, uh, primarily tension. Maybe there's a little bit of something else in there, but they're primarily tensile elements. So, and these are relative, are always gonna be the kind of the simplest numbers to design because you don't have to worry about buckling. You don't have to worry about geometric instability of the shape. You simply pull on it and it has a certain strength, it'll generate, generate a certain deformation, that sort of thing. So purely strength-based, basically based, or based on axial strength. Its capacity is based on axial strength. Axial tensile strength. Next, another type of axial element would be columns. And this has, there are two subtypes of columns you should be aware of. There's what you might call uh, sh uh, short columns and then slender columns. 
Short columns are those that uh, are short enough that buckler that buckling, for example, Euler calling button. I cannot talk properly. <laughs> for example, oil, that, uh, they're short enough that Euler column buckling is not a substantial consideration. Slender columns, on the other word, on the other hand, you have something like this, and you apply a load to it. Long before it reaches its full axial capacity, its full like elastic axial capacity, for example, it may tend to buckle, which means it will bow outward. Or if it's braced at the middle, it might do something like this. Something like that it might bow outward in, in a sort of double curvature. But that fundamentally is what uh, buckling is. And so I know I'm going through this fairly quickly. This is just a bit of a review from some of the things you would have learned in statics and mechanics. OK, so that's one type of element that we want to be aware of. We have compressive elements. Ele we have axial elements that are primarily loaded in compression. And those are columns. And the two uh, subtypes of columns we need to consider are short columns and slender columns. So be aware of those definitions. Other uh, than other types of members or other type and structural elements, we have um, sort of something that we'll actually look at later in the term. We have uh, sort of compressive span structures. And these are your arches, domes, and vaults. An arch fundamentally works by keeping the entire, even in bending, it keeps the entire um, it keeps the entire arch, the entire cross section in compression. And so you'll have a downward force and then a reaction force here and reaction force here uh, vertically, but you'll also have an arch or a dome uh, sort of uh, jutting out force, for lack of a better word, and you'll need some way of restraining that, um, re restraining those outward forces in your arch design. But I don't want to dwell on that too much. We'll be looking at that later in the term. Uh, other elements, you have things like slabs. You know, you know what a concrete slab is. Long, flat elements um, pr loaded primarily in bending. Um, flexural elements loaded primarily in bend bending. So flexural, that means they're bending. Um, thin elements. They do experience shear and uh, ax some axial forces, but primarily they carry uh, flexural loading. Uh, you can also have uh, shells. And these are elements that, are, that carry, they are thin elements, but primarily uh, in plane forces. So in other words, if you have a, a, a plate element that's a shell, it's going to experience some forces in plane but it's going to experience very little out of plane, very little out of plane forces. So some in plane for so mostly in plane forces, and with just a little bit of out of plane forces. And then we have two other types of elements we want to consider. And then I'm going to discuss the foundations of structural engineering. The three things from which all um, structural engineering flows. And we're going to come back to this again and again and again this term. So what's following is probably the most important part of our whole mini lecture here. All right. So we have um, some other structural elements that you should be aware of in terms of definitions. We have beams. And these are elements that are loaded, that experience uh, uh, primarily bending. Uh, mainly bending. But also shear. Because you can't, as you learned in mechanics, you can't have bending without shear. Well, except some really weird cases, but <laughs> let's not worry about the exceptions. So you know what, a, uh, hopefully by now, you know what a beam looks like. For example, a simply supported beam, you're applying load to it, it wants to deflect, and there are tools to calculate both the forces or uh, the uh, calculate the internal um, shear and bending moment and also um, calculate the internal stresses and calculate the deflections. That's the kind of thing you looked at a bit in mechanics and we'll be building on in this course. <laughs> 
And then combining beams and columns, you have beam columns. And these are elements that carry both axial load and bending. So if you have something like this, an element like this, and you have the, the, the sideways load, the out of plane load, that's going to create your bending, but you also have some sort of axial load. And then you have to deal with uh, certain kinds of combined stresses and things can get a little bit more complicated, but we'll look at that a bit more later in the term. Uh, but for now, I just wanted to introduce some basic structural uh, elements. All right, so let's erase this and then we'll, I want to define what I consider the three core elements of structural an uh, analysis and really structural engineering as a whole. And this is what we're going <clears> to, <throat> and this again is what we're going to use again and again uh, throughout this term and really into your later courses too. You can go all the way through a yeah, doctorate level um, structural engineering course book, and it's still, everything is still going to be built on these three key principles that I'm going to teach you. So, and this is going to be the final thing for today. So the three key elements of structural engineering. These are the foundations of the entire discipline. All of the tools we're going to use, all of the methods we're going to use, all of the analyses we will perform are ultimately gonna be based on these three fundamental principles. Uh, these are one, equilibrium. And this is what you saw in Sadek's class. This is the sum of forces in the X direction equals the sum of forces in the Y direction equals the sum of forces in the Z direction equals zero, force equilibrium or the sum of moments about some axis, for example, x, or sum of moments about a y-axis, or the sum of moments about a z-axis. These are equal to zero. You have, uh, basically, you're calculating forces, moments, torques, whatever might be applied to a structure, and you're setting them equal to zero because the structure must be in equilibrium. If it's not in equilibrium, then your building is flying through the air, and you have some sort of problem. So this really comes straight from statics. So that is the first key element of structural engineering in structural analysis and design. Uh, the second one is going to be compatibility. I can manage to write the word compatibility. And really, this comes from mechanics. Sort of. It sort of comes from mechanics. But for example, if you have, uh, consider for example, a reinforced concrete beam. So you have a beam that it's concrete all throughout, but it has some rebar down here at the bottom. What I mean by compatibility is that even though these are different materials, you know that they're going to exhibit certain paired behavior. In other words, if I, um, as the beam bends, uh, the concrete right at the interface, at the interface right between the steel and the concrete, the concrete must be moving the exact same amount as the steel at that interface. They have to be, regardless of what's going on with materials, regardless of their strength, if this is going to act as one object, things have to uh, be moving together. Or consider something like this. Imagine I had a, I don't know, a structure that was made of a couple linkages. And I pull on them. Maybe there's a, I don't know, maybe there's a fixed end here and I have two elements and I'm pulling on the one on the right. And they're, they're joined by say a pin connection. Well, even without knowing anything about what these are made of, I can't, without more information, I can't tell you what exactly would happen. But, you know, saying they have cert, a certain cross-sectional area, they have a certain, uh, 
modulus elasticity, that sort of thing, uh, they are going to each want to deform a certain amount. However, right at this intersection, um, the deformation experienced by this one and the deformation, if we call that one delta one maybe and delta two, where this would be the de delta one would be the deformation of the first one at that point on its own uh, right side, I guess, from my perspective, or, um, and then delta two might be the definition at uh, the deformation at that point uh, experienced by this one on the left, they have to be equal because they are joined together. Uh, compatibility fundamentally is saying, okay, well, let's look at the various pieces of our structure and say that um, even though they may be made of different pieces and different materials, if this one point is moving X distance, moving, uh, and because these two pieces are joined together, I know both of them will move by that same X amount. Um, and that basically the reason, the usefulness of that is that gives you another tool, another equation um, when setting up your more detailed analysis. Because that allows you to go, this kind of thing allows you to go beyond static determinacy, which we will discuss what exactly that means um, in the coming courses. So that is our second key element, compatibility. Compatibility, again, simply means compatibility, usually of deformations and strains. So you have structures made of different elements, but you know that they will be moving together if two things are joined together, and that fundamentally is compatibility. And finally, you have what's known as constitutive relationships. Constitutive, I can talk properly. Constitutive relationships. And really what this means is material properties. This is straight out of mechanics. I guess you could say this compatibility is a bit from statics as well. And I'm thinking about it. That could probably be from statics as well. So equilibrium is all statics. Constitutive relationship is really all mechanics and compatibility is somewhere in the middle. Um, but constitutive relationships, what I mean by this is you have to think of material properties and think back to say like a stress strain diagram. So we have maybe a strain on the, uh, on the X axis and a stress on the vertical axis. And you can remember some sort of strain diagram like this where initially you have uh, yielding on the left side of the graph and then as you move uh, to larger deformations, you get, uh, so you get, uh, uh, sorry, not yielding, you have elastic behavior on the left side of the graph. But once you reach your yield stress, sigma y at a certain yield strain, epsilon y, then you get a uh, constant force and yielding thereafter. So that's basically, this is a mathematical relationship or a graph of a material's properties. And this is just another tool that we'll use when calculating stresses and forces within elements. And so again, these are fundamentally the key, three key elements of structural engineering. These are what, these three things are where, what everything else flows from. We have equilibrium, we have compatibility, and we have constitutive relationships. And these three things are what we're gonna use for the rest of the term when learning to apply the principles of structural analysis. All right, well, if, we, if I was doing this in class, I would definitely be way over time. Um, feel free to uh, email me if you have any questions. If not, that'll do it for, for now. And as always, thank you.